Okay, so then it's now my honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Keith Armitage. He's a professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Disease at Case Western University, and he's vice chair for education and residency director in the Department of Internal Medicine. Through it, throughout his career, Dr. Armitage has focused on postgraduate medical education and clinical infectious disease, exactly the kind of stuff that Dr. Watanakunakorn was interested in. He also fulfills a role with Neomed, um, where, he sees a lot, where he sees Neomed students as a residency director for internal medicine at University Hospital Cleveland Medical Center. Dr. Armitage's title is Travel Medicine 2024. Please extend a warm welcome to him. Okay, I think I turned it. I am a baby boomer, so if I mess up, you can just say "Okay, boomer." Um, so I have, you know, I wear many hats at our institution. I have been the residency director for internal medicine for thirty years at, at UHVA Case Western, and we've had fantastic Neomed residents and chief residents, and so we're blessed with the gifts from Neomed during my thirty years. So um, another hat I wear is travel medicine. Um, the, the medical director for the Royal Green Center for Travel Medicine. I will mention, some of you may know, there's, there's a connection between Royal Green and Kent State. So Royal Green supports international health and travel medicine at UH. Big, big philanthropist and supporter of, of Kent State and theater. So a ni nice connection there. Um, so I came to Cleveland to do my residency in 1986, and I stayed for my fellowship. And um, remember when I was a, a young fellow, a fellow or a young attending, there was a group of really prominent ID doctors, kind of like the, the ID mafia of Northeast Ohio. There was Manny Walensky at Metro. There was Phil Lerner at the Old Mount Sinai. There was Marty McHenry at the Cleveland Clinic. I asked Tom File if he remembers any of these guys. And then there was Dr. Juana Kundakorn. And that was kind of this group of really successful Northeast Ohio prominent ID doctors. Um, and I was reflecting on Dr. Uh, Watana Kundakorn and, and just thinking about what he accomplished, you know, for the students here, you may not, you may find this shocking, but there was a time before there was no internet, no Google, no up to date. And the currency of academic medicine were original research publications, review articles and chapters. And Dr. Watana Kunikorn was really prolific, major contributions, really well known nationally. And kind of doing that from his, his base in Youngstown was really amazing. So. Really, I remember him, you know, I wasn't personally close to him, but I remember him well. And it's really an honor to be here to, to talk about um, travel medicine and his legacy, which is really fantastic. Um, uh, no conflicts of interest. Um, so travel medicine primarily involves advising people before they travel to high risk countries. Uh, it sometimes involves people who come back from countries sick that's the more interesting or challenging part of our job. Um, so by way of perspective, you know, half a billion people cross international borders every year, a lot of illness associated with it, including some serious illnesses and some mortality associated with travel. So the, the primary role of travel medicine doctor is, you know, is preventing people from getting sick when they travel to, you know, higher risk areas of the world, Central South America, you know, Asia, Africa, uh, et cetera. Um, there are really good resources. The CDC website for travel medicine is really fantastic. Um, often when I'm in travel clinic, I'll have patients who've been on the website and tell me what to give them, which is fine. Um, and I still look things up on that website. I had travel clinic yesterday. I was looked up a couple of things in the website. Um, so I've been doing travel medicine for 30 years. Um, I started in 1992 when I joined the, joined the staff of the hospital and the faculty of the medical school. And, and um, I get, it occurred to me in the last couple of years that it basically comes down to two things. Like when you travel, it, you know, Central South America, Africa, Asia, et cetera, the two ways you get sick are mosquitoes and food and water. And so a lot of what we do are, are dealing with illnesses you get from mosquitoes and illnesses you get um, from food and water. So I'm going to start with a case. So I have a few cases here. Um, 
A healthy seven-year-old man presents the Rogue Green Center for Travel Medicine for consultation regarding a trip to Kenya and Tanzania. He'll be flying to Nairobi, spending the night, and then traveling to Tanzania for a 10-day safari. He's told you need yellow fever vaccine to enter Tanzania. If you've been in Kenya, what would you do? So um, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about yellow fever vaccine because it's probably the most important vaccine we give in, in, in the travel clinic. It actually requires some kind of a, a license. It's not a big bar to get it, but you have to, you know, you, you can't, you have to have a license to give yellow fever. It's the only vaccine required for entry into some countries. Um, it actually wasn't produced in the United States for a number of years because of a manufacturing issue. Um, and, um, you know, by way of update, it's now a once in a lifetime vaccine. So, you know, for you first year students, maybe you're learning this stuff or second year students, you know, yellow fever is a, is a virus. There's a, a um, it circulates in non-human primates and can circulate in humans. It's spread to humans by mosquitoes, either from non-human primates or person to person. Um, um, it's a single strand of RNA virus, replicates in cytoplasm infected cells. There's one serotype. The vaccine protects against all strains and it requires a mosquito bite to get infected. So there's no human human transmission without a mosquito bite. Um, and it is a really bad illness, it is, a, it is a sometimes fatal illness. And when people get yellow fever, there's the, the usual prototypical viral syndrome, and then people feel better. And then if you read the older literature about yellow fever, the, the description was the period of intoxication. When people get really sick, fever, nausea, vomiting, hepatic failure, jaundice, a high case fatality rate. Um, the most endemic part of the world for yellow fever is West Africa. There was an outbreak in 2013. They identified 130,000 cases and 78,000 fatalities. Now there's probably cases they didn't identify. So the, the mortality rate was probably uh, over, over um, represented. Worldwide, there's about 200,000 cases, 30,000 deaths. And then yellow fever is important in history. The, the Panama Canal, a lot of, you know, the, the New World. Um, there is no antiviral drug for yellow fever. The diagnosis is made by serology, PCR tissue. Um, this is the yellow fever geography in 2016. So if you notice on this map, I, our, our traveler is going to Kenya, traveling to Tanzania. Um, Tanzania is not considered a high-risk area. I'll get back to that. And then you look at Brazil, look in, in South America is primarily Amazon. Um, again, this is this is the, the CDC recommendation for yellow fever vaccination. Again, at, apropos of the case I presented, recommended for Kenya, not for Tanzania. Um, and then um, just in 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 all of our fields as physicians, you know, things change. The ID world is very dynamic, travel medicine is dynamic. So for years, there was no yellow fever in the coastal urban areas of Brazil. There was an outbreak uh, of, of yellow fever in Brazil starting in December of 16. Um, and yellow fever entered the coastal urban areas of large cities of Brazil. And in 2018, the Brazilian Health Ministry issued a recommendation for universal yellow fever vaccination. Um, and before, you know, before this was recognized, there were 10 travelers to Brazil who got yellow fever. You know, in the in these areas not considered previously at risk, four of them died, and then 2018, the CDC now recommends um, yellow fever vaccination for most for almost all areas, but one or two cities that don't have yellow fever. Where I work at UH, you know, we have a number of Brazilian doctors. Many of them had grown up in the urban areas and never been vaccinated against yellow fever, so they're in Cleveland, and suddenly they're coming to our travel clinic because they're going to go go home and visit, and they need yellow fever vaccine. Um, relatively recently. So it's kind of crazy to me that the current yellow fever vaccine that we're using in 2024 was developed in 1936. It's insane that we don't have a modern vaccine. I'll talk more about that. The way the yellow fever vaccine was produced was I guess a, a sort of a, an older way of making a vaccine. You isolate the virus from a patient and then you pass it through tissue culture. You keep reculturing it, reculturing it, until you get a, a, a immunologically active virus, it's avirulent. So the so they're called live attenuated viruses. It, it is a, a an offspring or a progeny of the yellow fever virus. 
and it's a bit we'll talk about a, a bit dangerous. Um, is again, live attenuated vaccines are contraindicated in immunosuppression. So we have people come to travel clinic who are on you know immunosuppressive medicines for psoriasis or rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, and if, in a, if they want to travel to a yellow fever endemic area, you have to hold your immunosuppression for a while to give them the vaccine, uh, or or they, or they can't travel. Um, as I said, there are a number of years it was unavailable, um, and we got at our center we got the yellow fever vaccine through a FDA from France, and it drove a lot of business our way because. We're the, one of the only places that had it in Ohio. Um, you see in the picture on the card, as I said at the beginning, yellow fever vaccine is the only vaccine that is maybe required to enter a country. There's some countries where you cannot get a visa without you know, submitting your proof of yellow fever vaccine. Actually, we see a lot of tourists in Cleveland go to Ghana. As a West African country, Ghana developed a very robust tourist industry, part of the history of the slave trade, other things. You can't get a visa to go to Ghana without having the yellow fever vaccine. You come to us, you get the vaccine, you get that card that's your proof of yellow fever. Um, um, and so, and you can you can be turned away. You can't get into Ghana without yellow fever vaccine. And that's again the CDC website require it has these updated requirements for yellow fever. Um, and actually, we have, we have people who come to travel clinic. Cl clinic thinking they need yellow fever vaccine because they misread the CDC website because sometimes the fine print says yellow fever vaccine is required if coming from a country with yellow fever. So we have people make appointments. And I say, you, you don't need the vaccine because you're not coming from a country. Um, the risk of yellow fever, like everything in travel medicine, everything in travel medicine is related to where you're going, what you're doing and how long you're there. Um, and so location, duration, activities, um, rate of local transmission. Um, the overall risk per month in endemic areas is one to five per million two week trip. West Africa is the highest in the world, 50 per 100,000 uh, two week trip, South America less. There's been 20 fatal cases of yellow fever in Western travelers, you know, United States, Canada, Western Europe since 1970. There's never been a fatal case of yellow fever in any traveler who's ever received one dose of vaccine, incredibly successful vaccine. So the, the challenge with this vaccine, remember I said it's, it's the same virus that, that it, it's, a, it's a progeny of the virus that causes yellow fever. Um, and it can cause a, an illness. It can cause a neurologic illness. It can cause, you know, kind of fatal organ failure illness. Um, and it can be as high as 0.7 to 4 per 100,000 doses. So there's two syndromes. There's this encephalitis that can be fatal and what they call visotropic disease, an illness similar to yellow fever. Um, and again, there are rare random fatal cases from the yellow fever vaccine and otherwise healthy young adults. It's clearly associated with immunosuppression and age. And, and one of the reasons I, I presented the case I did if you recall the case I presented, it was a 78-year-old gentleman who's spending one or two days in Kenya before going to Tanzania. So you face this decision, is the risk of yellow fever in someone 78 years old greater than the risk of, a, of an adverse reaction to the vaccine? So, um, and it's highly associated with age. So hospitalization or death, 3.5 per 100,000 doses, 65 to 75, 9.1 per 100,000 doses over 75, so yesterday, I had travel clinic yesterday afternoon, and I had a, a, a woman spending three days in the Amazon jungle of, of Ecuador, and we had a long discussion about whether it was worth her getting the vaccine or not, you know, because you have to try to weigh the risk. Um, and then if, if someone is medically contraindicated, there's a whole form we fill out so they can still get a visa. Um, it's crazy to me that it's 2024 and we have the technology to produce a, a safe yellow fever vaccine, but there's no economic incentive. I mean, if, it, you know, if you think about the mRNA COVID vaccines, incredible achievement in a year, these highly effective safe vaccines. I, you know, it's probably, I'm not a, a vaccinologist or a virologist, but I think if there was an incentive and a will we could produce a much safer yellow fever vaccine. Um, 
So when I started in this business, everyone needed a yellow fever booster every nine or 10 years. Um, again, this is this is so interesting to me. Um, so in 1959, the regulations were yellow fever booster every nine years. In 1996, they changed it every 10 years. It's just easier to keep track of if it's 10 years. Is that why they did it? I don't know. Um, and then uh, about 10 years ago, they, the WHO advised that um, you no longer needed a booster. One, And what, it, it's interesting to think about because we all kind of got, at least us ID physicians, other physicians, really kind of got immersed in the vaccines during the pandemic. And so there's different ways you measure vaccine efficacy. In one way is by neutralizing antibodies. So you get the vaccine, you make antibodies, and there's thought to be some cutoff where your antibodies fall below a certain level. But it's much more complex than that. There's T cells, B cells, other mechanisms of protection. So the 10-year booster idea was based upon antibody levels falling in people. And they thought you needed to boost your antibody levels. And then several studies happen, with, which really fascinate me. That no fatal case of yellow fever has ever occurred from anybody vaccinated ever who received one dose of vaccine. Now there's been there's been a few people who got the vaccine and died from yellow fever. All the cases were less than five years after the vaccine. Their primary vaccine failures that the, you know wasn't stored right, wasn't administered right. So what these studies said was it's not about antibodies. It's more than antibodies. And so one successful dose of vaccine protects you for life. Um, that that changed recently. Um, became official policy WHO in 2016. Um, uh, so it's again, a dynamic changing process. Um, again, we, we need a safer vaccine. You know, it's kind of crazy that I said, said 2024. Um, so if this traveler had come to us in travel clinic, um, or he did come to us in travel clinic, I had a long discussion with him about the risk of yellow fever in Kenya for two days. And I think we ended up giving him an exemption because you know, his risk was super low, but he could not get into Tanzania without the vaccine. Um, if he'd come to us, we, we, you know, we have a sort of a standard, you know, more or less standard approach to almost everybody. So almost everybody who, who comes to travel clinic, we recommend the hepatitis A vaccine. Um, hepatitis A is the number one vaccine preventable illness in travelers. It's the risk almost everyone in the world. Again, if you think about hepatitis A, tends to be ubiquitous in developing countries. It's a mild illness in children. You get immunity for life, but it circulates in, in the water and the food supply in developing countries. And if you're a non-immune adult, you can get hepatitis A and get pretty sick. Um, and the risk of hepatitis A is as high as three per six per 1,000 travelers per month and kind of higher end travel, 25 to 30 per 1,000 travelers you know, off the beaten track. I will say one thing about travel medicine, if some of you may have experienced this, it's not covered by insurance. And it tends to be expensive. Like the first time someone goes to Africa who's middle-aged, it may be $700, you know, and, 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 and we're conservative. We don't give things like rabies in our clinic. Um, there's a for-profit chain that gives everybody rabies just to make, it's really outrageous. They give everybody rabies just to make money. Um, and, and there's an inverse relationship between the ability to pay for travel medicine and your risk. In other words, high-end affluent travelers staying in, in safe environments can afford travel medicine, but the risk is low. If you're hitchhiking around Southeast Asia for a year and you have no money, you need everything because it's really high risk. That, that's the relationship. Um, so we, get, we recommend hepatitis A to every traveler except anywhere but Canada, Western Europe, New Zealand, Australia, Japan. Um, and now some of you may be young enough, you got it as childhood. So, you know, hepatitis B has been a routine immunization of children for, you know, forever. Hepatitis A became a routine immunization of children, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. So we're just now seeing, in, I'm, you know, I work with adults, we're just now seeing people come to travel clinic her age 20 who had hepatitis A vaccine as children, but people over 20, 21 have it. Um, and if, you, if you're going to go to Cancun for a week, if you're going to go to Belize and you called us, we would recommend hepatitis A. But I've seen cases of hepatitis A from Cancun. Um, um, there is a combined BA vaccine 
So if, if someone needs both A and B, you can give them, you know, B is three doses, A is two doses. So A is a two dose vaccine, give, you know, time zero, then between six and 12 months. So the, the combined AB vaccine is time zero, one month, you only get B, and then at time zero in six months, you get AB. Um, we tend to be conservative with hepatitis B. Hepatitis B, you know, you know, hepatitis A you get from food and water. Hepatitis B you get from blood and body fluids. You know, affluent middle-aged older travelers usually are not at risk for hepatitis B. Um, so hepatitis A vaccine is safe. It's incredibly effective. You can give it on the way to the airport and it still works, you know, even though, you know, the, um, the current thought is it's if you get two shots, it's good for 20, 25 years. I think there's some uncertainty. Um, another routine vaccine we give is typhoid. Again, like hepatitis A, typhoid you get from contaminated food and water. The risk is much lower than hepatitis A, um, and there's a lot of variation. The risk of typhoid fever is, is based upon your how safe you are with your food and water. So when you come to travel clinic, we have a standard spiel for food and water. You know, no water unless it's bottled or boiled, no food unless it's cooked, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the CDC language on typhoid is often kind of gray in that, like for, for a country like um, Thailand, the CDC may say, recommended for people who are off the beaten path, who have adventuresome eating habits, who, who are unsure of safe food and water, or people that want maximum protection. So I've had the un, the unpleasant experience of seeing one half of a couple of, of going to Thailand, for instance, and say, I didn't recommend typhoid fever. And then they saw one of my colleagues on a different day, the other, the other half of the couple who recommended it. It makes us look like we don't know what we're doing. But it is kind of a gray area. And I mentioned earlier, travel medicine is not covered by insurance. Hepatitis A is now. So the typhoid vaccine is like 150 bucks. So if someone comes to us because they have to have yellow fever, we can convince them to get hepatitis A because it's covered by insurance. They they think about the cost of typhoid a lot because, you know, and I, you know, if, if they're super careful what they eat and drink, they, they may not need it. Um, th there's two types of typhoid vaccine. There's a pill form, which people like, but it's a live vaccine. It's not, it's contraindicated. There's a there's a an injectable form. Um, injectable form is good for three years. The oral form is good for five years. Um, some other vaccines for travelers: um, measles. So, people born 1956 and before all had measles, but you know after that, it's not you're not sure you had everyone had measles. The vaccines that were used between sort of 57, 68 around there did not provide lifelong protection. So there's a cohort of travelers born between 57 and 68 who need an MMR boost. Um, and, you know, measles is the most contagious illness in the world, practically. You know, you can walk to the airport and catch measles from somebody, you know, who's, who's coughing. Um, and we do give measles vaccine in travel clinic. Polio, there are, you know, people vaccinated against polio 50 years ago may need a booster. Travel clinic is a good excuse to get um, to get to remind people to get their their tetanus booster, their 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 um, DPT booster. I mentioned hepatitis B. Most of the people who are at risk for hepatitis B already have it, and you know, sort of elderly, high end travelers who are not going to become romantically involved with the locals don't need it. Um, there are a couple of cases where we use meningococcal vaccine. So there's there's a part of Sub-Saharan Africa called the meningitis belt. So sort of from West Africa to East Africa, it's recommended. And then um, there's a whole kind of literature around vaccines for the Hajj, vaccines for the annual religious pilgrimage to, 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 to Mecca, Saudi Arabia. If you're going to go on the Hajj and go to Mecca, Medina, these, these holy places, you cannot get a visa without the meningitis vaccine. You know, several million people congregate in, in, in the holy cities in Saudi Arabia during the during the, the um uh, during the um the season and it's kind of an infectious nightmare there's outbreaks of diseases influenza new, and there's been outbreaks of meningitis and um you know Saudi Arabia is a very wealthy country they put a lot of money into the infrastructure for the Hajj um but they do require meningitis vaccine so people come to our travel clinic 
who are who are you know going up, go on their religious pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia just from just from the meningitis vaccine. And then one that I really I always hate the most, well, is is Japanese encephalitis. So Japanese encephalitis is a similar illness to West Nile. It, it, there's an animal reservoir. You get it from mosquitoes. Most cases are mild. Occasional cases are fatal. And um, it's really you know prolonged exposure in rural Southeast Asia, primarily during the rainy season. It's it's like several hundred dollars to get the vaccine. You know, so someone who's who's hitchhiking or backpacking around Southeast Asia, they need the vaccine. Probably can't afford it. Um, Hopefully their parents will pay for it. And, uh, um, you know, somebody's going to go to, you know, Kuala Lumpur on a business trip for four days does not need Japan Japanese encephalitis vaccine. Um, and then um, I, I said that hepatitis A is the most common uh, vaccine preventable illness in traveler. The most common illness in traveler is what we call traveler's diarrhea. Traveler's diarrhea is a thing. Um, and the, the sort of the standard approach to traveler's diarrhea, as I mentioned a minute ago, is a preventive strategy where we get, we tell people to be careful what they eat and drink and so on and so forth. As I said in the beginning, it's all about mosquitoes. And I should say, we talk about mosquito mitigation. Basically, long long sleeves, long pants, insect repellent that contains DEET. We start, I, I give the same spiel over and over again. I need like a hologram of myself for travel clinic. But, you know, we talk about mosquito mitigation. We talk about food and water precautions. And it's become... Um, it's become kind of standard in, in, in the travel medicine world to do what we call presumptive therapy, presumptive self-treatment. So we give a prescription for modium in either Cipro or Zithromycin to, to, to most travelers with instructions to self-treat if they develop traveler's diarrhea. You know, Cipro used to be used a lot. We're using more and more Zithromycin now. In Southeast Asia, it's all one alone resistant Campylobacter, so it's always it's always um, azithromycin, and it you know you know um, I, I see at least one ID colleague here, Dr. File. You know if you come to us in 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 Northeast Ohio and you you think you might have you know infectious diarrhea, we almost never give you antibiotics. It's self limited. There's no there's not a benefit. In travelers, there's a lot of studies in travelers show there's a big benefit. The major agent of travelers diarrhea is enterotoxigenic E. coli. So E. coli that, that produce a toxin that causes, you know, it interferes with, with the water and solute absorption in, in the intestine. And when you give an antibiotic, you turn that off right away. And, you know, people are spending a lot of money for a two-week trip somewhere. You don't want to be laid up at all. So, again, it's kind of standard in the travel medicine world to do this, do this um, uh, empiric self-treatment. Not prevention. It's presumptive therapy when you get ill. And you know, I graduated from medical school thinking you never use anti-motility agents ever in any infectious diarrhea. I don't know if, 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 if Dr. Farmer, there was a really good review article in CID a few years ago saying that's probably not true. Um, it's definitely not true for traveler's diarrhea. So um, I'm gonna do another case. This is a case that um, I ad adopted from the MMWR, a, a real case. A healthy 65-year-old woman presents to urgent care complaining of the onset of paresthesias in her right arm while gardening. She is diagnosed with carpal tunnel syndrome. A day later, she presents to the ED with shortness of breath, anxiety, insomnia, difficulty swallowing. She's concerned about maybe a toxic substance in her garden. They do some workup. They diagnose her with an anxiety disorder, panic attacks. She goes to her car. She feels panicked again. She returns to the ER. It's given additional you know, anxiolytics. I don't know if anybody knows where this case is going. It is a travel medicine case, but uh, um, the next day she calls 911. She goes to a third hospital. She's having chest discomfort. She's having paresthesias, dysmetria. Her lactate's elevated, her troponin's elevated. EKG suggests cardiac ischemia. Uh, atypical chest pain goes to the cath lab. So what's your next move? So one of the keys to travel medicine is taking a history, right? And you don't put travel-related illnesses in your differential diagnosis unless you ask the patient. And we'll talk a little bit about malaria later. Malaria gets missed because the patient doesn't volunteer. They came from an area where there's malaria, and we as you know, the providers don't ask them about it. So this lady had been in India seven weeks before. She had a six-week trip to India. It sounds super cool. She went to some ashrams, kind of a spiritual journey. Her last week in India, she got bitten in the hand by a puppy. 
starting to ring a bell. Um, she became more agitated. She um, developed hydrophobia, you know, wouldn't drink water. She got sicker and sicker. She was intubated, sedated, had an LP. Long story short, she died of rabies. And it's a super tragic case, and I'll explain that why in a second. Um, one of the fascinating things about modern modern medicine, modern molecular biology is you can uh, you can type if you isolate a rabies vaccine from a patient, you can say what animal reservoir and what country it came from. So in her case, they knew it came from a dog in India. Um, rabies is um, is endemic in dogs, 122 countries, nine deaths in travelers since 2008. India has the highest incidence of dog mated rabies in the world. Actually, I've worked in the travel clinic for 30 years. I've given the rabies vaccine twice, and I'll explain why in a second. Once was two veterinarians who are members of an organization called Veterinar Veterinarians Without Frontiers, and their project was to take care of rabbit dogs in India. I thought they deserved the vaccine. But um, what's really fascinating about rabies is it has a really, really long incubation. Incubation is typically several weeks or longer. And with you know, there's been several case studies. This is fascinating. This is New England Journal about 15 years ago. There's they reported several cases where incubation was a year, nine months, six months. Because these are people that, like, say, immigrated from Mexico, had not been back to Mexico, died of a strain of rabies that was a canine strain in Mexico. They had it for a year before they got sick. Rabies is 100 prevent preventable percent preventable if you give post-exposure prophylaxis, prophylaxis before symptoms. So we have a standard spiel for travelers. If you get bitten by any mammal, dog, monkey, any mammal, you have seven to 10 days to seek medical attention. The people that died of rabies, there's several case reports. This one, I know of several others, one from Kathmandu, one from Kenya. None of them got sick for six or seven weeks completely preventable during the six or seven weeks. So we make a point to just put in people's mind, if you get bit, the rabies vaccines are super expensive, not covered by insurance, they're painful, and they're not necessary if the individual is aware of post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, one of the questions I hate the most as an ID doctor is, I get a call from a colleague. We found a bat in our house. Should we worry about rabies? It's a very vexing question because the answer is probably not. <laughs> so actually, I don't know if Dr. Father remembers this case. There's a case, uh, there's a seven-year-old girl in Connecticut, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, who out of the blue died of rabies. And the family had reported a bat in the house that had access to her bedroom. So the, the rule for rabies, certainly in children, became if there's a bat in the house that you can't, you can't say it didn't have rabies, you didn't capture the bat and do a necropsy. If, the, if there's a bat in the house and the bat had access to a child's bedroom, you got to give the post-exposure prophylaxis. If anybody touches a bat, you got to get post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, now, the, Ohio, the, uh, the, the veterinary school at Ohio State will test the bat if you, if you kill it and capture it. And again, there's a long incubation. So if you do that, you know, you can wait until you find out whether they had rabies or not. Um, so case three, um, the patient is a 42-year-old woman from Eden Prairie, Minnesota, who went on, this is another from the MMWR, who went to Kenya on a three-week safari. This is about 20 years ago. Prior to leaving, she called her you know, family friend who was also a family physician asking for medicine for malaria. And he said, oh, here's some chloroquine. After returning from Africa, she visited her sister in Sanibel, Florida. Great lifestyle in Africa, Sanibel. Um, <laughs> um, after about 10 days later, she developed fever, fatigue, went to the local ER. She admitted to the hospital in Fort Myers, diagnosed with plasmonium falciparum malaria, the very high parasitemia. This is, you know, this is a, a slide of a multiple infected, you know, plasmodium falciparum a patient. Um, she died in the hospital in Fort Myers and they, the, the family sued the hospital in Fort Myers. Um, so malaria is a fatal illness, particularly plasmodium falciparum, but also plasmodium vivax, vivax can be fatal. It's completely preventable with safe medications and the wrong medications is not uncommon. 
Um, so it's important to have knowledge of up-to-date malaria prophylaxis, and it varies from country to country. Um, and then there was a famous um, uh, travel medicine doctor named Keen, I forget his first name. He wrote a great article uh, called Malaria of the Mime. When people come back from malarious areas, they can have, I mean, no Western traveler reads the textbook about malaria and comes back with like fever every three days or three every, you know, it just doesn't happen that way. People come with fever and headache, fever and abdominal pain, fever and diarrhea. And unless the, the ER doctor or the primary care doctor is aware of a travel history, malaria gets missed and people do die when malaria gets missed. So, um, and people can present weeks later with malaria, usually not, not so much falciparum weeks later. Oh, this case that I presented from MMWR was a couple of weeks. Um, so it's, it's always, you know, in, if someone comes, presents to medical care with an undifferentiated febrile illness, travel history is an important question. Um, so in terms of the time frame with falciparum malaria, 6% don't present um, until 30, 30 days or more. With Vivax, it can sometimes be more than a year. Um, so the patient I talked about got chloroquine. Chloroquine was a standard medicine in the 80s. Chloroquine resistance spread you know, throughout the world. There's only a few parts of um, the world where chloroquine is still a, 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 a recommended medicine for malaria. Um, so I, I started in travel medicine in 1992 as, as an attending physician. And between 1992 and 1996, the medicine that we prescribed was called mefloquine or alarium, a medicine notorious for significant neuropsychic side effects. I mean, serious side effects. Um, doxycycline works, uh, th and then talk about malarone. Um, so mefloquine was a standard medicine until about 1996 when malarone got approved by the FDA. It's a weekly medicine. You know, the, 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 the literature is rife with reports of people are being admitted with psychosis for mefloquine. Actually, my chairman, Dr. Richard Walsh, not a HIPAA violation, he gave me permission. I, in 1995, I prescribed mefloquine for him going to Uganda. He had like developed hallucinations and psychosis. He stopped it. He recovered, allegedly. You know, we're just kidding. But um, um, so so uh, there. You know, mefloquine was highly problematic. Um, doxycycline was an option. If you know about doxycycline, sort of the major, most common adverse reaction to doxycycline is photosensitization, sunburn. Not a great drug to give somebody who's going to a tropical country to be in the sun. Um, and then, you know, again, I'm so old, 1996 seems like modern times to me, but um, Malarone was approved in 1996. It's really a fantastic drug. It has almost, like, almost no side effects. I mean, it's, it's, its tolerance is really great. It works great. Um, it used to be more, it used to be like eight to $10 a pill, which was a barrier for people going for a long time. It's actually cheaper now. And this is now, Tovacomproguano is a generic name, Malarone is a trade name. This is like the standard medicine we use in almost all patients, especially shorter term travelers, um, unless, unless they're going to one of the few parts of the world where you can still use um, chloroquine. Um, this is a new medication, I'm not gonna talk about it, it's more for, um, so we talk a lot about, um, I said mentioned earlier, we talk about, about mit mosquito mitigation. And we tell travelers, we talk about yellow fever, if, if, it's a, if it's a yellow fever area and give the vaccine, we talk about malaria and give you know, malaria prophylaxis, but there are significant illnesses you can't prevent with a vaccine or medication. And probably the most important is dengue. Um, I've seen some prominent people in East Ohio the last few months who had dengue from, from South America. Um, I call dengue the, the McDonald's of, of, of arthropod-borne viral illnesses with like more than 2 billion served. Um, it's very common. Right now, there's a major dengue outbreak in, in, uh, in Brazil. Occasionally, we see dengue that crosses a border like in Texas. Um, so the only way to avoid getting dengue, and there's also, you know, chikungunya, 
someone was going to mention chicken. One of the students was going to say, what about chicken gunya, Dr. Armitage? Right? Anyway, I just like saying chicken gunya. It's another virus you can get from mosquitoes. Zika, another virus you can get from mosquitoes. Um, the only way to avoid these viruses is minimize mosquito bites. So we really emphasize mosquito mitigation. Um, and dengue is a really fascinating illness in that um, the first time you get dengue, you're, it's a, you know, it can be a mild illness or you can be like a bad case of the flu, it can be pretty sick for a few days. Um, there's different strains of dengue and getting infected with one strain not only does it protect you against other strains, it potentiates your immune response and you get like a cytokine storm of subsequent cases. So the first case of dengue is usually not fatal. Subsequent cases with different strains are fit, can be fatal. And if you go to um, if you go to the Philippines, for instance, during the rainy season, the ICU is filled with dengue cases. We had a, we had a couple uh, who grew up in India who went back to, to Hyderabad to visit, came back with dengue. The husband had a mild illness. He was IgM positive, IgG negative. The wife had a pretty severe illness. She was IgG positive, IgM positive, which means she had probably had dengue with other strains before and had this kind of cytokine storm, potential illness. So we, we emphasize travelers, you know, if you've never had dengue before, it is not that serious an illness, but getting it more than once can be fatal. So just don't get it the first time by avoiding mosquito bites. Um, uh, long pants, long sleeves, insect repellent that contains DEET, we recommend at least 30% DEET. You know, people are afraid of chemicals and DEET's been around since World War II. I think people look really long and hard for adverse reactions. Um, there's really there's really not many. Um, and then um, the pandemic was interesting in many ways. <laughs> um, the, you know, the the travel medicine business, the travel, you know, the, our travel clinic obviously um, had, had you know, business fell way off, certainly in 2020, you know, before the vaccines came out. Um, people started traveling again once they got vaccinated. Um, and, and now, of course, people are traveling like crazy now. There's like bent up, pent up travel from the pandemic. And this is a little bit of, you know, maybe it's in the past, but um, during the pandemic, up until at least 2022, there were a lot of requirements that you had to research in advance. Do you have to get tested? Do you have, you know, what proof of the vaccine do you need to go? So knowing, again, this is maybe not that relevant in 2024, but, you know, it's so interesting to me in that um, every country had different requirements different um, requirements for vaccination, different requirements for testing. And one of the, you know, a lot of my professional colleagues started traveling, say in 2022, to, 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 you know, to you know, Asia, Africa, South America. And the great fear we had was testing positive and not being able to come back and, you know, missing work. Um, I had this experience, I, I um, we had this uh, affiliation in Saudi Arabia and, and I like think in February 2022, I went to Saudi Arabia and I became very fluent in all the requirements in Saudi Arabia, what vaccination proof I needed, what testing proof I needed. And on the way back, we were flying through Heathrow. So we went to the ticket counter in Riyadh to get our boarding pass. And the guy goes, have you registered with your British health authorities yet? I go, what do you mean? We're not even leaving the airport. We could not get a boarding pass without registering like as, as travelers with the health, public health authorities in, 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 in England, Great Britain. So this is like one in the morning in Riyadh, you know, three middle-aged doctors on our webs, on our laptops, you know, on our phones, you know, trying to get their certificate that we had registered with English health authorities. Um, most of that's now in the past. There's, you know, there's almost no requirements now, but it's been you know, relatively recent there was. And then um, people still ask me as a, in, in the travel clinic, and it's happening less and less, but people would ask me to take to to prescribe, you know, Paxlovid um, to take with them in case they got, you know, COVID nineteen. And I was happy to do it. Our our inpatient pharmacy at UH um, would not give Paxlovid unless there was a positive test. Um, but CVS and you know, so you know, we we would give Paxlovid to travelers who asked for it, who were worried about you know contracting COVID. Um, 
particularly high risk individuals. Um, so there's a few a few rare things. Um, there's been cases of of leptospirosis. Um, uh, it, I think um, Dr. Quinn, medicine woman, got leptospirosis kayaking in Puerto Rico. I'm so old. You guys never heard of that show, but uh, um, <laughs> um, you know, people do 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 adventure water sports in developing countries. Risk for leptospirosis. I've seen one case in Cleveland. A woman, she was you know diving and swimming in in, in I don't, Ecuador, Peru. Came back with leptospirosis. Um, seems to be on the, on the increase. Um, um, eosinophilic meningitis. Never seen a case, but it, it happens. It's it's a fascinating thing because it's a, it's a rat lungworm that you get from eating primarily watercress. So there was um, twelve cases in kind of high end travelers who went to a fancy resort in Jamaica. And they had sort of a watercress salad on the menu, and they all got eosinophilic meningitis from the you know the snails and the and the uh, and the parasite. So again, don't eat anything uncooked outside of safe areas, even if it's a high end. Like we tell you know we tell people no food unless it's cooked or you peel it yourself. Now, if you travel to, to, you know, Asia and you see at the really nice hotels, the breakfast bar has, you know, slices of papaya and mango, that's a low risk, you know, not zero risk. Eating a salad anywhere is, is, is considered high risk uh, to me. Um, and then um, we don't do a lot about DVTs. Um, you know, usually the people that are high risk for DVTs know it. Um, some of the recommendations for DVT prevention is to avoid alcohol or caffeine. People don't love that recommendation. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the most important thing, if you're on an international flight, get up and move around, you know. Get up and walk around every couple hours. That's probably the most important thing. There are some people we recommend aspirin. There are some people, really high risk people with a history of, 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 uh, of, of coagulopathy, we might give them some, you know, Lovenox or heparin, or I guess this is old. Of course, now Doe acts like Eliquis. Um, and then um, I said at the beginning of my talk, 98% of what we do is pre-travel care. It's fairly routine and protocol-based. Actually, uh, tr I, I, I find travel clinic a, a very, um, it's an exhausting experience because I do, I like yesterday morning I had my ID clinic and I, I ask questions, I take a history, the patients talk, you know, I, you know, I have an interaction with the patient. Travel clinic is every 20 minutes, me talking, me teaching, me engaging, do that for four hours. At the end of four hours, I'm like spent. I really am. It's much harder than like a regular clinic where it's more of a ongoing interaction. And as a doctor, you're doing a lot of listening and travel clinic Every 20 minutes, you're teaching the, you know, the two people. Um, so there are syndromes in returning travelers. Um, and, I, and you know, there's a whole, you know, there's book chapters and review articles about, you know, fever in returning traveler, which isn't obviously the, the topic of my presentation. But, um, and the differential diagnosis of an illness in a returning traveler depends upon where they went, what they did and the incubation. And probably the most important thing to know is that any fever in any returning traveler who's been to an area endemic for malaria is malaria until proven otherwise. And, you know, we see, um, you know, I've worked at UH a long time. We see several cases of malaria a year in returning travelers. Um, the highest risk travelers in general are what we call VFR. Anybody VFR? So see, there's a whole lingo. You didn't know, you didn't know this. There's a whole lingo associated with travel medicine. So VFR stands for visiting friends and relatives. People visiting friends and relatives are much more likely to, to eat unsafe food, or if they grew up, if they grew up someplace, less likely to seek travel medical care because they're used to. So the high, one of the highest risk parts of the world in travelers for malaria are West African expatriates 
who grew up in Nigeria, Ghana, you know, the, you know, the, and then they, they grew up there. Malaria is a thing. People get malaria. They don't worry too much about it. 20, 30 years later, they take their family back. They don't, yeah, malaria, no big deal. And then, you know, you can get really sick with malaria. So um, VFR, visiting friends and relatives. So fever and returning traveler is malaria until proven otherwise. And there's a difference in diagnosis, short incubation, things like dengue, long incubation, like typhoid fever. You know, there's a whole, they're gonna, again, I'm sure up to date has a good chapter on fever and returning traveler. Um, other syndromes include um, eosinophilia, um, diarrhea, and you know the, we worked that up. And then one of my favorite is skin lesions. There's something called bot fly or myiasis, where flies lay their larvae in living tissue. So people go to the beach in you know Central and South America, maybe fall asleep in the beach, um, and then they get these these itchy, painful bumps on their legs, and they come to us and we diagnose. It's called myiasis it freaks them out to say, yeah, there's a fly larvae under your skin that's alive. So it, it's disconcerting to them. It's a very self-limited thing. It, you know, the, the larvae eventually die, but uh, um, people don't like it. Um, and then um, we tell people to wear seat belts, of course. Um, road accidents are always important. So I think that's my last slide. Uh, I think I left you know eight or nine minutes for questions. You know, I, I organize the grand rounds at UH Case Western. We never start on time. Super impressed they start on time today because I figured 55 minutes. Our grand round speakers always go long because they don't start till five after. Anyway, thanks for your attention. So, um, that to be a question. I forgot anything. Um, awesome. Um, a common theme in a lot of the cases you talked about were um, people who caught it could have been like diagnosed earlier if they had a proper history done. So I was wondering if you could kind of talk about the challenge that like emergency medicals, like ERs and people who aren't infected, like yeah. why, to say it bluntly, why are they so bad at like missing these things? Yeah, no, I think that, um, I mean, I have ultimate respect for ER doctors. That is a hell of a hard job. Just every shift is lots of sick patients. And and so, you know, if you see someone with an undifferentiated febrile illness who doesn't tell you they traveled, do you ask a travel question? Now with Ebola, if here's a lot of ERs now kind of like as part of the intake in ERs, but it's easy to miss a, a diagnosis like malaria if the patient in front of you doesn't volunteer that they were recently in, you know, Africa, the Amazon, you know, India or something. So it's, it's part of it's, you know, always taking a careful history. Um, you know, there's a joke. I don't know if I love Dr. Glauken Flecken, if you guys know him, his take on ID is really great. You know, the, like, you know, the, 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 the history was so deep, you know, it's, it's, you know, it was you know 30, you know, so ID doctors, we ask about travel, we ask about pets. That's kind of a routine thing to do, but if you're a super busy ER doctor and, Someone who's otherwise healthy comes in with a fever, doesn't volunteer they're in a malaria endemic area, you might not ask. Um, and a lot of it is educating patients. But I, I, I say we, we really emphasize education about rabies because it's so preventable. Um, I don't routinely say, oh, if you get a fever when you come back, um, make sure you tell the doctor you have you, you were in, in Africa. Um, we do tell people to call us if they get a fever. And you know we like doing post-travel care. It's a lot more challenging in in in, in than pre-travel care. So does that answer your question? Really appreciate the question. So most people with malaria, most returning travelers from malaria start with their family doctor, an urgent care, or an ER. They don't go to ID. So the family doctor, the urgent care, the ER has to be the one to think of it. And that's a challenge. Um so I've had a, a, a couple of cases of typhoid fever in our hospital, and um, I, as they came to me, and the two cases I saw in the last few years came to me with positive blood cultures for salmonella typhi. So I said, you know, obvious diagnosis of typhoid fever, blood cultures in hand, you know. Um, and you know, one was a guy he would, he'd um, he graduated from college in in Pune, Maharashtra, India, and he was coming to Case Western for graduate school, 
And before uh, before coming to Case Western, he and his friends went out and croused in Mumbai for, a, you know, ate a lot of street food, you know, drank a lot. And then he comes to Cleveland and um, it was during the Feast of the Assumption in Little Italy. And he started getting getting sick. And he came to the ER and says, I think I ate something bad at the feast. And the ER did blood cultures and sent him out. And the blood cultures came back the next day, salmonella, said, yeah, you ate something bad at the feast in Mumbai, <laughs> not in Little Italy. You know, it was, it was, he's a nice kid. It's funny. He did okay. But uh, anyway, um, other, any other questions? Um, yep. Yeah, like, you know, the, um, a lot of questions saying like uh, the yellow fever vaccine is very effective. So do you, I mean, this is actually outside of my field. Do you believe like the patient recovered from the yellow fever disease will be lifetime immunized? Yeah, if you survive yellow fever, you're immune for life. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to worry about it. Kind of like measles. One case of measles, you're immune for life. You know, not that we recommend getting measles, but um, so... Um, so I have a question. Yeah. Why is there no vaccine for malaria? That's a fantastic question. And um, it's a very tricky parasite with a lot of mechanisms to escape the immune system. There are some experimental vaccines. There's been some clinical trials. Like the, the, the greatest morbidity and mortality from malaria are children in equatorial and West Africa there are some effective vaccines now. They're sort of in testing. The, the clinical trials are promising. Um, but, the, you know, it, it's not clear. You have to keep immunizing people. I'm, I'm not that fluent in that literature, but it's problematic. And you can ask yourself the same question. Why don't we have a vaccine for HIV? So there's some illnesses just lend themselves to vaccines, and there's some illnesses that don't due to the biology, the immune escape. The, and uh, malaria has been a tough, tough nut to crack, although there is progress on a vaccine for malaria. So great question. So hi, thanks for coming to talk to us. Um, this is kind of a philosophical question, but as the world gets a little bit warmer and mosquitoes are able to like move closer and closer to us, is there do you foresee the likelihood that some of these diseases end up becoming endemic to the US? Hundred percent. Particularly like dengue. You know, I think like um I mean, we here in the United States, we're in this weird political time where because of politics, a big segment of the population downgrades public health, right? Public health has been incredibly successful in well-resourced countries at ending yellow fever, ending malaria, things like that. I think I think our public health infrastructure can probably handle malaria, but we may see more dengue in the United States in, in you know in the in the southern southern countries. I mean there was yellow fever in Cleveland in, in, the, in the 18th century. And, you know, yellow fever has been eliminated in, 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 in well-resourced countries, you know. And, um, uh, and, you know, we could see, I mean, there's, again, I, you know, I didn't, I could have talked more about this, but climate change is important in medicine in general. And it's important in travel medicine. It does, it does change the range of some illnesses. You know, the, the areas that are endemic. So that's 100% keep an eye on all these things. So great question. So. All right, if there's no more questions, let's thank Dr. Emmett. Yeah. And um, I'll, just, I'll just circle back. As I said, I, when I was a young ID doctor, I looked up to Dr. Watanakunakorn. It's a great honor to be here and give this lecture. Thank you. So.